Hi, everyone. We're talking to Scott Tepfer, uh, an L.A. shooter. Are you close to L.A. To enough to say that you're an L.A. shooter? Yeah, professionally, yeah. I always say I might work in L.A. Yeah. Well, it's great to meet you. Nice to meet you, too. We were just discussing before I hit the record button that uh, video that you did. It's better in the wind. You were saying that it's it was shot over a period of how long? Uh, the video portion of it I shot over a 12 to 14 month period between uh, what the end of 2010 through the end, at least it just at the end of 2000. And uh, still got me here. Yeah. Um, you know what? I'm trying to record this. I don't think this is going to record. You know what? Let me turn my video off. Okay. And it's cool. <laughs> all right. We're talking to Scott Tepfer about uh, It's Better in the Wind. And initially that was a book that you did with just uh, just some stills. Yeah. The uh, the first book, well, I guess a little backstory on it. I, I lived kind of all over the country assisting and, uh, you know, mm -hmm. trying to make my way in the, in the photo world. And when I moved back to Los Angeles, some of the guys I'd grown up with, had started riding motorcycles and we all grew up riding bicycles together. So I kind of saw this little web of people form and I started taking pictures and realized that if I wanted to kind of get into this, I had to get into a, a motorcycle. And so I sold everything, which was, I sold my 5d and I sold my car and I bought a motorcycle and film for, uh, for my Canon a two and we kind of just rode around and anyways, long story short, it, it turned into a book and anybody who is kind of taught film, uh, cause we're, I'm kind of right on that generational cusp, I think between film and digital. So when you learn uh, how to shoot film you, you, and put together a book, it's you, you sequence it. And so I came out with a very traditional sequenced black and white book and kind of at the tail end of that, I started, shooting uh, shooting video because I had kind of saved up and was able to afford um, a 5D Mark II. And through some work, I was able to kind of fund that. And in learning how to use that camera, I started shooting all this, this subject matter that I was creating with stills and, and yeah, and created a film over the next, the next year. So it's, you look at that, that footage and the first, the first few, times working with it the camera's all sh is pretty shaky and i slowly but surely figured out how to study it out you know more or less if you've watched it it's uh you know it's definitely right in the thick of things and there's no steady cams or anything like that so no i i can't it looks, looks like some of them uh, you're sitting on the back of a bike and shooting uh, someone else is driving and some of the things looks like it's mounted right on the bike itself well for that you know this is i've I've told this to a couple clients since then who asked me how I shot that. And there's a couple of shots where I, I shot from a passenger perspective, but a lot of that is shot while I'm the riding footage, at least is shot while I'm actually riding the bike and the camera's still handheld, which, <laughs> which yeah, the clients, clients do that. They laugh and they kind of scoff and they realize that their insurance doesn't really cover that. <laughs> and which, you know, fair, fair enough. But, yeah, that's we didn't. I didn't have any rigging, or um, I've slowly started to accumulate some of that gear now. And uh, yeah, a lot of it, it's all handheld and from a motorcycle with myself riding or someone else riding it. So you that's know, how some of those angles kind of came. And, and way back in the day, I had a chopper Harley with extended forks and a suicide clutch. This is the yeah. first time I've heard of a suicide camera. <laughs> Yeah, it's uh, it's not smart, and I, I you know, art a isn't times, smart. A couple close calls of uh, of not, a couple close calls where I almost busted my camera. But the only thing that really hit the ground while riding was a little flip cam that I had, that I just carried in my pocket, but I never ended up using any of the footage from it because it broke on the first time we took it out. So, but yeah, speaking the the chopper Harley, I got well. There's one. It's not. It's not a chopper. But I got another one in the back that I'm working on, and can't really divulge too much on that project yet. But there's more kind of coming from that end. 
And that's uh, looks like a Bonneville over there behind you on the other side. That is a uh, it's a 1968 BSA Victor. So uh, a good film if anybody's kind of into bikes is uh, it's called Cycle South, which was uh, I think it was made in the I want to say 71, and it's it's a great film. These like old off road bikes and everything like that. I um, had a 67 BSA Victor. That was all chrome. I don't recognize the tank. Is that the is that the this, uh, stock tank? That's the stock tank, but the stock tanks had a uh, had a yellow front, and it was almost like it started off racing gold, and then came back to the raw aluminum, and then had a little had like a little pinstripe flare on it, and uh, that paint that paint's long gone. Ah. <laughs> it, uh, it was it was so beat up, and it, you can probably make out in the video that that. The tank's not in the best of shape, but that's probably the best running motorcycle I've ever owned. The um, the law at the time when I was uh, uh, 14 said you could have a scooter here in Phoenix. had to be five horsepower. And uh, we discovered that you could get a five horsepower decal. And, and stick it on the bike. We stuck it on the bike and, you know, stopped a couple of us like, well, no, sir, it's a five horsepower. It looks awfully large for five horsepower. Yeah, it's just for show. I mean, I, yeah, it's I English. Yeah, it doesn't really go anywhere. <laughs> That's right. It's like a Jaguar. It only runs on Sundays, so for sure. Yeah, it, it runs on the weekends. So See, I've, I've I've definitely put that thing through its paces, and uh, over the last couple of years, and it's it actually runs like a champ, and I've never really had to do anything with it. So you know, knock on wood. Yeah. So you shooting a lot of uh, digital, and are you shooting still shooting a lot of film? Yeah, I. Uh, you know, clients on the, on the work and the client end of things, pretty much everybody, you know, the deliverables always come into digital and the art directors always want a little bit of film, but when they, I think when a lot of people say they want to shoot film, they really mean, I want you to shoot digital and then retouch you, make it look like film. Mm -hmm. And, but yeah, so on, on the work end, it's a lot of, it's a lot of digital, but personal projects, portfolio projects uh it's all film um about half my printed portfolio that i show to clients is film and are you is it mostly 35 or are you shooting any of the larger formats uh i just finished up a shoot i have an old uh Hasselblad 500c and i use that on occasion when it's a uh, some sort of fashion or portrait i'll get into that but if it's something lifestyle and Action packed. I typically, uh, I'll shoot, I'll shoot 35, and it'll either be on, I have a Canon A1, or I'm sorry, a Canon A2, an N1, um, and I have a, an Olympus OM1. That uh, that thing kind of came through in a pinch on my honeymoon when I had a contacts, a little contacts T2 point and shoot go out of uh, go out of commission on me. And I bought this little OM1 out of this mom and pop shop in Utah, and that camera is fantastic. Yes, I, they it's are. Not, it's I throw it's it's in the passenger seat of my lot. I take the camera home sometimes and do days where I'm not going to take a bunch of pictures, but if if I know something cool could happen during the day, I tend to throw the OM1 in the passenger seat. What just one lens, the 50 or 35 or? Uh, you know, when I bought that thing, I got the OM-1, a 28, a 50, and I want to say it's a 135. Yeah, the OM-135 um, for 200 bucks, and mm -hmm. like all great condition. So, but typically the 28, the 28 will stay on there. I have a, this fascination and love with the with that kind of. 50s and 60s street photography aesthetic. So the 28's on there a lot, and sometimes I'll I'll throw the 50 on depending on what I'm doing. Yeah, you can't get any better glass. Some of the best. No, it's so simple. The There's just nothing to it. There's no frills. It's a real simple meter. If you like, you get into a tricky spot. I mean, everything works. Mm -hmm. Just two little dials, a winder, and a crank and button, and that's all you need. <laughs> I just got back from Fredericksburg, and I took my um, my Nikon F2, uh, the F2N. I didn't take my F3, 
and I, I took the motor off of it because, you know, back in the day, of course, we all had to have motors. I mean, that was just, sure. you know, the idea of thumbing your thing. Oh, that was not cool. Today, yeah, cool. I, I take it off. I like take a picture, crank it to the next one, take a picture. Right. There's a Zen yeah, to it. That's, oh, yeah. Save eight batteries. <laughs> and the thing, I think the thing was made out of old tank metal. I mean, it weighs, the motor weighs more than my 6D. Yeah, those those F series, like everything, the lenses, the accessories, the bodies themselves, the prisms, I mean, they're insanely heavy. And, but they're, I mean, you can drop them out of, you can drop them off a tank and they're still mm -hmm. fine. Um, the OM is, is a little bit more delicate than that, but it's, I mean, it's a palm of your hand camera as far as SLRs go. I love it. Well, this is very interesting. When I first discovered your site, and uh, you can see it there behind you on the screen, I asked myself, well, you remind me of another photographer I really, really like a lot, which is Jake uh, Stengel. Yeah, Jake's a buddy of mine. Is he? Ah, oh, I'm a big yeah. <laughs> fan, of, big Jake Stengel fan as well. And cool. when I look at your work, I don't see a guy standing there with a big giant DSLR and some 70 to 200 lens, I see a guy standing there with, and when you say the OM, <laughs> that's like exactly what I had in my head, like an OM or a, um, an old uh, Leica, you know, it has that look of, of um, precision uh, to it. And this first shot here, this uh, black and white shot of the guy, is that that's film, right? Am yeah, I right I'm or is it? I'm trying to pull it up here. Actually, I don't see it behind me. Hmm. How's that? There it is. Got it. Yep. Okay. The guy standing there, um, the sunglasses shot. Hmm. Yes. It's actually that shot now is digital. And that's a client shot. Um, sunglass a simple sunglass campaign we shot and i think one thing i try and and tell clients now or i mean anybody for that matter is that i think results wise you can really you know uh you know final output you can really match digital to film in a lot of in a lot of uh, respects, not not in all, obviously, because I mean, in in my opinion, I think film is paramount. But you know, probably eighty five percent of what you shoot digital, you can match to film. Mm -hmm. um, and I think a lot of that comes down to technique. I mean, the way you shoot things. And I, I tend to try and get closer to people and and you know shoot full frame and in, in a and at least plan ahead of time for shots. And and I think that time, you know, for this shoot, it was real simple and loose and, and I had the kind of creative freedom to just wander and get whatever I wanted. So, um, yeah, well, it's, a, it's yeah. digital, it's digital and Photoshop it, magic. Unfortunately, it sure enough. does look like film to me. I just thought for sure. Um, when you're out shooting like this, are, are you, are you, am I right in saying that you're a lot of editorial, a lot of editorial work? I, you know, I don't get as much editorial as I, as I wish I did. <laughs> I mean, I would, I would kill to be, I mean, you, you speak about Jake and Jake is fantastic. Um, that guy shoots editorial all day, every day, has a great studio, lives in a great city, and he is always on the road shooting editorial. I would love to be doing that. And... Maybe I, I don't maybe I don't reach out enough to magazines and maybe that's something I need to correct. But um, I like to shoot even a bit, you know, that being said, all of my commercial work comes with a storyline pretty much. People are interested in stories and so I shoot commercial work like editorial, or I like to think I do. Okay. Um, yeah, so I wish I was shooting more editorial. Then you, you're, uh, I know you're shooting for resin and. What's it yeah, um, iron and resin. Iron and resin. They, uh, they're a young brand based in the town I live in, which is Ventura, and I wasn't living here at the time, but I grew up near here, and they, uh, 
they actually contacted me in 2011 and asked me about licensing some of the photos from my book. And I, you know, I told them I wasn't really interested in licensing, but for the budget that they were working with, I would shoot, I would shoot their catalog or shoot their branding book for the same budget as they were going to license photos for. Cause I thought it was a good idea. Mm -hmm. Um, and that shoot went fantastic. We all meshed well. And my, my now wife and I, we were looking for a place to move that was outside of LA. Um, and so we ended up, you know, after the shoot, I convinced her to, to let us move up here. So they've become a real good family and I've shot for them for the last, uh, two, three years now. And they just they talk about a dream client I mean, they're good people. And they just let me, we kind of brainstorm an idea and they just let me shoot. <laughs> they just let me shoot what I want and don't, you know, don't micromanage it too much. That's um, cool. We were there in yeah. uh, Ventura last September and in the, okay. uh, in the store, they had a, a rebuilt, I think it was a 73 triumph right inside uh, the door. Oh, the, I called the wife. Right. She said, she said, no. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you know, you always kind of got to pass those things through the boss. Yes, and, the uh, boss is in control. I, I sold bicycles all through, I think from the age I was like 14 through college on the weekends. Like I sold bicycles, and I swear, like, I learned that phrase. Like, you ask the boss. And and so even now, like, I use that phrase all the time. Like, you have to ask the boss. You do, and there's yeah. a, you know what uh, what not asking the boss is called? divorce dog house, dog house. <laughs> two dog houses <laughs> right to divorce <laughs> yeah it's uh, i mean uh i don't know maybe it's like this weird subconscious scheme i had but i somehow figured out my penchant for motorcycles and old cars and and carrie my wife is fantastic and i i geared my portfolio to shooting this stuff so when i buy something she knows that it's for work and pleasure mm -hmm. Yeah. And when the tax time comes around, like every everything I've ever owned in that vein is a prop. I mean, I had a, a 69 station wagon that ran mediocre, but I bought it for $2,000 and it ran fine. But I think I used it in six shoots. It was a huge car, so I could use the, the rear end for one shoot. I could use the front end for a different shoot. I could use the seats for a different shoot, depending on what I was shooting. And you talk about camera car rental fees and hitting up people on Craigslist or the, uh, the Los Angeles movie car people. And I, that car paid itself off probably five fold in one year. No. Oh, yeah. Uh, so yeah. So I figured out how to, how to get the toys into the business budget yeah. a little bit yep. to keep, you know, keep the boss happy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, that's, it's interesting. That's, that's our, my family's favorite place to go, Ventura, and uh, my wife. Uh, we love to go to Carpinteria. Oh yeah, right up, right yeah, up the road from up. you there. Yeah, I mean, we live, we live in Ventura. We live right off, uh, right off the seaward, off the coast, and uh, and spend a bunch of time around here, just kicking around at the beach. And it's a different, it's a different vibe. I think uh, on the business side of things, you know, I go to LA probably two times a week, maybe mm -hmm. three times a week, but a lot of a lot of our work now in the creative and artistic world, I think, is a lot of telecommuting. I mean, I mean, stuff we're doing right now. Yep. And I think, uh, you know, meetings, conference calls, all that stuff is is real simple without having to have FaceTime. But, you know, so when I'm shooting or when I have a meeting where there's a portfolio involved and we really need to be involved, I can't really, you know, conference call a client from my dingy garage but um <laughs> but you know like so so it's it's but okay it's, we it's video you know, scott all you have to do is fix one corner just yeah right yeah <laughs> like, like a tv studio <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Um, but, but yeah i will say i um living we live about an hour from the city i cruise up the coast and i need to go for work and we got twice the square footage and a yard and a garage versus a 400 square foot studio apartment in Venice with really crummy neighbors. Yep. So, you know, I'm, I'm all about 
living a small, normal human existence instead of the big, like, flashy party that, LA thing. That small, thing. normal existence with three motorcycles? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, everybody's got to have a hobby. And my yeah, hobby kind of still is part of my job. So in my, yeah, uh, it's funny. I have these things, but my wife knows that if we ever needed money for rent or if work got slow, it, they'd be all the first things to go. You know? In my garage, I have three drum sets. Yeah, because oh, see, there you go. everybody needs three <laughs> drum sets. You know, I think that's like one yeah. drum set more than I really need. But in case I lose one, you know, you misplace it. Yeah, you miss, man. You you lose a wing nut on that uh, on that top hat, and you need another top hat. Not a, I, and I have a spare now. I mean, it's it's all yeah. about the backup. Every that's... time you want to try, if you buy a bass drum, you might as well buy the whole kit because it all looks good together. See you. See you understand. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah. I mean. Uh, you know, I had a British bike. I'm like, cool. Well, I love my British bike. I should buy a Harley. And I'm like, oh, I love this Harley, but I should get a really old Harley. And then the boss starts looking at me like, you better know what you're doing. <laughs> but, you know, <laughs> that's how it goes. You, I, I try not to get too, too attached to certain things. I mean, I think there's only one camera that I've actually, I take that back. For a long time, the only camera I I had and cherished was uh, was my Polaroid, and everything else was just a tool that I could get rid of if I wanted to. But I've grown pretty attached to that Hasselblad and my OM1 as as simple a camera as it is. But it's worth, you know, on the resale market, it's worth nothing compared to how much I love using it. Yep, I have a 500C as well. I mean, it's old it's camera. So simple. Yep. Again, like just easy. And I, I went over to our, uh, I wanted this portfolio shoot and it was, I wanted to do a portrait, like a real squared up, nice and tight portrait, which I actually just put on the blog. And I wanted a portrait lens for it. And we walked into Sammy's camera, which is our big chain in LA, just on the way over there because I was picking up some film. And they had an old uh, 150 millimeter uh, F4 lens. And I got it for 250 bucks, and that's, you know, this, not it's not super multi-coated or whatever, but for what I'm shooting in black and white, it, it worked perfect. And, you know, I just shot with the 80 on it for so long. But anyways, anyways, I love that camera, and I can be a little long-winded. <laughs> I I have too many cameras. I, you know, I've been at the business a long, long time, and back in the day, formats were a big part of the decision-making process. Sure. You know, we had to figure out what, what we were going to shoot it on. And I, and I miss that. I'll tell you the truth. I really miss because there are shots that come up today. And I think I would love to shoot this on eight by 10. This is this call. This shot calls for eight by 10. And, and, uh, and then the clients find out how much each sheet of film is going to cost them. And they say, no, it really, really doesn't call for eight by 10. Yeah. Like, no, 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 you don't need to do that. And that's unfortunate because, because I agree with you. I think, I mean, if you look at my site, and if anybody looks at my site, they'll notice. I mean, there's not a lot of tripod going on in my in my shoots. There's very little tripod. It's always in the car. It's always on the shoot, but it very rarely gets used. And the pro and the photo that I uh, I just uh, just shot, I had I wanted to shoot it for two and a half, three years now, and I've always had it in my head. It was going to be square format on a tripod like locked down and I'm going to shoot a couple rolls of film to nail this one picture that's been stuck in my head. And, um, and it just, it was beautiful. <laughs> and the way it came out, I was just really, really happy with it. And um, I'm going to click my video on and share this one with you. Sure. Oh, it's beautiful. Look at that thing. It's a 250 millimeter F uh, five, six sonar. See? Beautiful. And it's so they don't make things like that. No, they don't. And it's so sharp. I can't even yeah. tell you how sharp it is. <laughs> it's razor sharp. This I this is I... part of the fun of photography. And the, the other interesting thing about my Hasselblad system that I have now is I only have two lenses. I have a a 50 and a 250. So, oh dang. You, you want it wide? And a super telephoto. <laughs> That's great. Pick one because you can't have anything else. I'm looking for a good 80. I think a 
an 80 sonar is probably on the the uh, future yeah. for me. So I got lucky. Oh, <laughs> I got you lucky did. Anyways, oh, that OM second. that OM kit, man, for two hundred dollars. Oh my god! Oh, yeah. When I shot I shot a buffalo with a one thirty five in Yellowstone, and which is again, you look at my site. That's not exactly a site or photo people would expect from me, but it's just like I don't know. You, you feel like you connect in a different way when you get to use something old and metal, and I don't know. It's there's a different feel to it that I think is the real craftsman of our of our trade. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, and I, I find myself, there are a lot of guys who are, you know, 20% camera and 80% Photoshop. And, and I, I love that, that work as well. I look at it and I just, I absolutely love the work some of these guys put out. It's not me. I can love something and not want to do it. You know, I right. can ad really admire um, someone like Tim Tatter, who is a absolutely fantastic mm -hmm. photographer. And right. I look at his work and I go, this is great. I don't want to do that work. I'm glad he wants to do that work because he does it really well. Right. Yeah, um, there's a there's a there's a photographer for every client, and I uh, and that's something funny because you know I most of my Photoshop work has always just been like stripping the cyan out of the sky or you know adding a little noise back in because the the way the uh, the way our cam our cameras are so advanced, they're so super like super real or hyper real, um, that if you just strip a little bit of that tone out of there and a little bit of that richness, it it, it feels a lot better. It feels more real, I guess you could say. Yep, yep. I that's I take all the I take cyan out. I add a little yellow, and I desaturate yeah. the blues for this. For me, shooting digital reminds me of Provia. It just it's oh, that really bright blue sky and those reds that jump off and i was more i shot a lot of uh ectochrome i mean that's all my clients want is ectochrome but when i was shooting for me i was shooting c41 because i liked the the muted skies i liked the muted greens and the reds it just had a different color palette uh and that's for me what i like so now i find a way to make that color palette work in digital or I just go out and shoot some C41 and have it scanned. Oh, for sure. Hang on one second. I got something for you. Now, that, now we're on the subject. I just left a frame during the interview. I have a whole box, speaking of. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it, uh, it expired in 1985, which is... So it's largely useless, but, you know. <laughs> you know, here's the, I, I've got a story. I've been in business so long, i got a story for everything. But i got a story. We, we were doing a, a uh, shoot, a portrait shoot for a uh, local magazine. And uh, my assistant at the time was kind of new. I had a box of 4x5 that I had purchased out of date. And it, when I purchased it out of date, it was like 10 years out of date. And then it had been left in the refrigerator for probably another 10 years in a freezer, right? So he went in and loaded the, the stuff with that that film. We shot 30 sheets of it. Whew. It came out really weird, but really oh. cool. <laughs> the art yeah, director goes, oh, how did you do this? I didn't have the heart to say, uh, we loaded really old film and <laughs> the emulsions yeah. like kind of messed up. He says, can we do it on the next shoot? Uh, Nope. <laughs> nope. It's all gone. Yep. I got 20 sheets and I'm going to save it for something for me. So yeah, for sure. That's, I have, um, I was living in Boston when Polaroid went out of business and, which, and they're based in Cambridge or they were based. Um, and I remember when they went out of business, I was, I had no money. I think I had $500 to my name and Knowing that I was going to get a paycheck in a week, I spent all of my money and bought as much Polaroid 667 as I could find. And I bought $500 worth, and I have 30, I have 30 pulls left of 667, and I think I'm probably going to use most of them on uh, my baby boy. <laughs> ah, <laughs> because yeah. nothing, nothing else really gets, I mean, nothing feels as important as that. So My favorite was the 55PN. 
Oh yeah, I have a couple. Wait, that was the one with the with the, the negative. Positive. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, made it a positive, and you got a beautiful, absolutely stunning negative. I never really got to shoot with that. I had a couple friends that did, and they would use those negatives and then make uh, sixteen by twenties out of them. Mm -hmm. just, oh, beautiful! Just, but at the same time, like strange. Like there's just a weird. Well, there was. Like there's no silver. Thing. No silver in the yeah. negative. It was all dye. Yeah, it's just it's got a, like a strange look when it prints. Mm -hmm. So it's cool. Yep. Well, I would like to uh, ask you a little bit about your marketing. Um, sure. How do, how are you doing your marketing? What's what's your do you have like a plan or is it pretty much catch as catch can or? Well, so I'll start off by saying I think what's worked best for me, um, and I think this is the way the business is going in a large way. A lot of our business is built on relationships, so I've been really successful at meeting one person or one art director and you know getting to know that person and 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 kind of fostering that relationship i mean in a friendly and a professional manner between the two of us and and that you know over like a longer term will t turn into work so i've been that's been a big thing for me if i meet someone that's got a similar interest i really kind of focus on on those people and and uh you know, and see if work comes out of it. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't, but regardless, like you're having good conversations back and forth. Uh, it takes a little bit of time and it's a, it's not as wide a net as I imagine agency access would, would like for me, but, um, you know, but that being said, I don't use any of the, uh, I don't use any of the big, uh, marketing sites. I do, um, Instead of postcard, I did postcards for a while, but I don't think they really did anything. Um, I like to send out. I've printed newspapers, like just four page, or I guess it's yeah, it'll be four page newspapers with an op big open double page spread, and then two outside mm -hmm. uh, covers. I've done those and sent those out to clients, and people really seem to like that because you know I'll just write a little note on it and. It feels like a it feels like something more substantial than than a postcard, and it gets shipped in an envelope, so it's not just a postcard that you see everything and you toss. Like you actually have to open it. Um, that's worked well for me. I've sent prints to clients I know, who I you know who I know from our conversations will like a certain photo. Um, you know, but that being said, um, you know Jake and I were in Portland, kind of getting started at the same time. Um, you know, trying to find our way, and he and I both shared some contacts and some some uh, constructive criticism on on cold calling, and I definitely cold called Wyden and Kennedy in Portland a couple of times before they let me in the door, and so it's you know you find you, and that's something else I think that's important is that I don't send. I don't send uh, print pieces to the marketing people at JCPenney. And not to say that JCPenney is not a good company or a good client, but I don't think that my stuff resonates with them yet in such a way that it's going to, that I'm really going to hone in on them. You, you're uh, finding the people who you want to work with, who you know want to work with you. Yeah, or think, or, you know, or people that I think would appreciate what I'm trying to do, you know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because anyone who spends any time on my site and looks through my personal work is going to know there's a lot of motorcycles and, and that's a function of my, of my personal life, of my passion for Americana stuff and, and motorcycling in general. But I feel like that resonates with, you know, a whole array a whole array of clients. I mean, I could see, you know, you know, motorcycle image resonating with Levi's or Dickies or Danner boots or Gerber knives or REI or all this adventure and Americana. Like there's tons of brands out there for every single type of photograph you shoot. And I've, um, and I, you know, I'll find a campaign or something I've seen printed that I really like 
and try and figure out who, who got into it and feel like that person might appreciate some of the stuff I've done. And, and I kind of go after that person directly, you know, um, sure. Yeah. Long story short. Yeah. I like to, I like to kind of focus versus just casting a huge net and hoping I catch something. Cause that doesn't, it doesn't feel super personal. Um, I do a lot of specialized people right now. Totally agree. I do a lot of consulting with photographers and marketing, helping them understand markets. And one of the things I, I tell them to do is instead of trying to send out a postcard to 5,000 people, which is also known as just simply wasting your time, try to identify 60 to 100 max that you look at, like you're saying, you look at their, their work, what they like to do, and you look at your work and you think, honestly, they should be using me because I have that kind of vibe or that kind of feeling that they like. I would like to work with them for the same reason. So you market to them and you cut your, your marketing expense down, but you increase the bang for every buck because they're possible clients for you. Yeah. And there are, I mean, it's a real personal touch. I mean, if so, you see, I, you see a campaign that you like and you can see their direction. You feel like yours might be a little bit different of a direction or whatever. I mean, it's, it's got such more personal of a touch. If you can write that person and say, Hey, you know, check out my portfolio or these images, you know, I really liked what you did with that, uh, with that Harley Davidson ad, or I really like what you did with that, uh, Bridgestone tire ad. Um, mm -hmm. I think you'd really like my take on it or my take on, on that style, you know, and just that way it's meaningful on your end. It's meaningful and worth the person who's receiving it. It's worth their time too. So oh, perfect. Absolutely. Perfect advice. Let's look at some pictures. Sure. Let's That's what it. we do, right? That's what we do. <laughs> I'm going to pull up uh, your portfolio one and, and just uh, actually, you know what I'm going to do, Scott? I'm going to click on the presentation thing here. Okay. And I think that's it. Oh, wait a minute. That's not it. It's this. I'm going to make you the presenter. So watch for a little screen thing there, and you can take us through this uh, on your at uh, your pace, okay? Okay. And you should have a little thing there on your screen. Am I right here? Okay. Okay. All right. So I'm going to bring, I'm going to put your video away and bring your, bring the screen up there. So are you in control of it now? Uh, all I have is a control of my little video window. Uh, okay. Okay. Now I'm seeing, I'm seeing your screen now. You're seeing, Qu okay. You're seeing this. I'm saying, yeah, connected to uh, that. Now I should be saying, yeah, there we go. We'll just, there we go. <laughs> we'll just do it that way. That works. Fair enough. Okay. Uh, what would you like to look at? You're looking at the portfolio. I was looking at portfolio one. Um, 